Good, good. Uh, vacation Bible school. Everybody have fun at vacation Bible school? Henry, did you have fun at vacation Bible school? Luke, what was your favorite part of Luke? Probably the game. Uh, you must have had an amazing game, Luke. Do what? Lauren, what was your favorite part? Everything. But if you had to single out one, probably game. Science. Okay. <laughs> Science. There's, there's, we're going to talk about big things, little things, important things, and not so important things. Okay. And vacation Bible school is a pretty important thing, wasn't it? Okay. Like Jesus would be an important thing. Going to church is an important thing. Reading our, reading our Bible and our devotions would be an important thing. And then there's not so important. What are some of the not so important things that we do every day? To, I mean, there, there, there's nothing wrong with them, like friends or going to the pool or video games or all that stuff's not really as important, right? Well, we only have room for so many things every day, right? So I'm going to dump these rocks out right now. And the, and the big rock is Jesus. Okay, big deal. Okay, so what what do you think we need to put in here first? We need to put the big important things in first, or we need to put the little not important things first? The big things first. Let's see what happens if we put these little not important things in here first. If we put going to the pool first, or uh, whatever, you know, like you're too little for a cell phone, but like video games first and all this other little stuff first. We can put all this little stuff in there first. Okay, and then if we have room, then we can, you know, we can throw Sunday school in there. Then if we have room after that, we can put, you know, give it to our missions and, and things like that. And going to church, we go in there kind of at the end. And then if we put Jesus in last, can we get, does it, does it fit? It just doesn't work very good, does it? Okay. But what happens if we get it right? What if, our, what if we do our, what if we do our order the way we're supposed to? So what goes in first? big one, Jesus goes in first. Okay? And then, we probably need to put like Sunday school in there. We need to put giving to our, our missions in there. We need to put vacation Bible school in there. Then we can put like our family, mom and dad, and our brothers and sisters in there. And then we can put what would come next. After that, you think. There's not a wrong answer. Just whatever comes next. And then, once we get all the important big stuff in there, then you think we have room for going to the pool and our pets and like Wi-Fi. I mean, that's a pretty big thing. <laughs> and all this other stuff. Video games can even go in there. But there's nothing wrong with video games. It just can't go first, right? And if you put that little stuff in there, and if we put the big stuff in first, and then you put the little stuff in later, now what happens? We can fit this, doesn't it? Okay? So we got to make sure that we put the big stuff in first. And that's not just a kid deal, that's an adult deal, too. Okay? I, I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to you. Okay? So just remember, put the big, important stuff in first, and not the little stuff. And I think we'll, we'll make everything fit a lot better. Okay. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for today, and thank you for these uh, young ones. I just pray that we would all remember to get our priorities right and put the big stuff in first, followed by the little stuff. So we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.
<laughs> Sometimes that works better. Get your hymn books out, and we're going to start at page 101, and we're going to do 101, 102, and part of 103, one or two verses of that.
Oh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Jan, thank you for this offertory time. Um, Jan offers up her services and Jean does too, of course. To many people like Trey who do the uh, children's story, we thank them for their offering, giving of giving of themselves. Um, Macy did an amazing job leading Bible school this week. Felt like we're kind of hanging on by our fingernails because half the staff was sick or gone and the kids were there. And I thought we were losing them as the week went on too because of the sickness, but uh, he did an amazing job. Uh, Brendan gave up a week of his time to be with our older kids and we appreciate that so much. Karen with flowers, um, the stewards, our mission committee, they did a lot of work behind the scenes. We appreciate them. Um, many, many ways that we can serve the Lord and, and offer our time and talents. Um, and we appreciate all of them and uh, hope that everybody can get involved. And is it next week we do our model call uh, Pastor David wants to call it the business meeting because people won't show up. But, uh, <laughs> We want to get reports from all our different committees and what's going on in the church that you may not be aware of. And uh, so plan on coming next week. I don't know what the food plans are. Potluck. Potluck. First time we've been able to do that for a couple years. So praise the Lord for that as well. Um, for an offering verse, I would like to read from Psalm 96, verses 7 through 9. It says, Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people, Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. All these programs also uh, require money, believe it or not. And if you feel so led, there's a plate in the back. And uh, you can feel free to, to leave it there. Macy, so we, do we still do online giving as well? So you go to the website and click on there too if you'd if you rather. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for providing for all of our needs, not only of this church, but uh, of us personally and for our community, Lord. We pray that you will take this offering, not only our time and our efforts and our talents, but also our monetary offerings this morning, and bless them, Lord. Give us wisdom on how to most efficiently and best use them to bring glory and honor to you. This is your church, your offering for you, and we just praise you and thank you for this beautiful morning. In Jesus' name, amen. so you'll get my line voice. Join with me in your Bibles in Revelation chapter 12. The scripture lesson begins, uh, we're actually going to do chapters 12, 13, and 14, but we're going to focus in on chapter 12, beginning in the 7th verse. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. Read that with me. He was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. And the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth. And his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, and the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, 
O heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows his time is short. One of the qualities of a well-told or a well-written epic is that it has both the ability to zoom in, to focus tightly and be very descriptive so that you actually feel like you were there. But a good epic also can zoom out to the larger grand plot that is present. The last two weeks, as we've been going through the book of Revelation, looked at John's words that are very sequential and detailed. Seven seals have been opened. And then as the seventh seal was broken down into seven trumpet blasts, and while the focus of these last six chapters has been quite detailed and focused. In today's text, John zooms out and he reestablishes the grand plot. The battle and the seals and the trumpets and the bowls at the end of time are because of an ancient holy war that has been going on. Before the creation of the earth, God's holiness was challenged and a cosmic conflict began with a rebellion among the angels. When mankind was created, each side of that conflict tried to entice man to align with either the righteousness of God or the evil of the deceiver. In today's text, John acknowledges the struggle between the purpose of God and his enemies. John exposes some of the players and the tactics that are used by the devil, but he concludes with a reminder that the outcome has already been determined. With Satan losing and Christ judging the ancient in repeated rebellion. <coughs> the coming conflict that is described in Revelation will not be a new war. It will simply be more battles in the war that has been raging since before the dawn of time. And it currently rages today. But it will cause greater turmoil in the future until the enemy is finally defeated. The serpent who tempted Eve reappears as a dragon in today's chapters, and the battles of today's three chapters are already seen today in our world in 2022. And it has been seen in the human experience for the last 2,000 years. We see in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in this heavenly place. Our battle is not with microphones and computers, but spiritual powers that are at work in the world. Our battle is not with people who vote different from us, but against spiritual powers that are driving a worldview that is either for or against God. We don't wrestle against what we see. We are involved in a holy war that has been happening in the cosmos since before humanity was ever created. But we continue to engage in the battle because we also see in 2 Corinthians 10.5 that we are to destroy the arguments 
and every lofty opinion that is raised against the knowledge of God. And our responsibility is to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We can't entertain the arguments that set themselves up against God. But we need to take our imagination, take our thoughts captive, because our goal is the obedience of Christ. And so we have to avoid the other options. <coughs> the conflict that was, is, and is to come at its root is opposition to God. The opposition to God we see in Revelation chapter 12, and it begins by telling us about a woman. This woman is the source of our Messiah. Several commentators who try to downplay the role of Judaism My notes keep jumping back. Several commentators who try to downplay the role of Judaism in God's plan simply call the woman the people of God. <coughs> However, the Gentiles, most of us, did not get grafted into the people of God until after Christ came. So I believe it is most appropriate for us to see this woman in Revelation 12 as representative of the Jewish heritage from Eve up until Mary. This woman that we read in Revelation 12 cannot be the church because in no sense does Christ come from the church. Christ came from a Jewish heritage. This woman is not Mary specifically because the red dragon that we will read about in a moment fell from heaven long before Mary was born. He opposed the plan of God for hundreds of years before the nativity. Dr. Dan Green, one of my professors at Moody Bible Institute who wrote the revelation portion of the Moody Bible Commentary. <coughs> excuse me, I'm still fighting that virus that we had this week. So allow me one big excuse me right now and we will trust the Lord for his will together. Dan Green points out that the sun, the moon, and the stars that we see here in Revelation 12 is actually connected to Genesis 37. These luminaries identify the woman as symbolic of Israel. This interpretation fits well with Joseph's dream in Genesis 37. The sun and the moon um, stood for Joseph's parents, Jacob and Rachel, Genesis 37, 10. And the 11 stars represent Joseph was the 12th were Joseph's brothers. And here it represents for us the 12 tribes of Israel. So we're introduced to a woman who is opposed by a dragon. This story of a, a battle between a woman and a dragon appears in a lot of ancient mythologies. Stories between a woman and a uh, dragon can be found in the Ugaritic Baal cycle, in the Babylonian Marduk, in the Persian Ahura versus Azi Dahakia, Dahaka, I think, in the Egyptian Hathor versus Typhon, in the Greek Apollos versus Python, and etc. Many of the ancient um, mythologies have a battle between a dragon or a serpent and a woman. But the battle between this woman, between this dragon here, is identified with many heads 
and many crowns. The heads of this serpent, the crowns that they wear, represent kings and empires that align with Satan's purposes. It's later identified in Revelation chapter 17 as five world empires that were before John's time, one empire that existed during John's time, and it told of a seventh that was yet to come. And so Revelation 17 interprets what we see here in the middle of Revelation 12 about a dragon with many heads wearing many crowns. But this dragon led a revolt. But even though this dragon tried to revolt against God, God was never actually threatened by the revolt. As a matter of fact, as I read this story, God didn't even fight for himself against the revolt. He simply said, Michael, why, why don't you take a couple of your buddies and, and, and deal with this little uprising? According to John's vision, Michael and his team of messengers were adequate to squash this uprising. It was nothing but a nuisance to our almighty and our sovereign God. But in the mind of the rebels... They had got one over. We see a woman in the beginning of verse 12. We see this dragon who opposes the woman. But the woman does bring forth a son. The son who is the Christ of God. A, might, a male child who will rule one day, but is temporarily in the presence of God before he comes to establish that rule. Look with me at verse 10 of chapter 12, where he is actually described as the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah of God. Now, contrary to the thinking of narcissistic generation, not everything is about you. We are soldiers in a war that opposes God but the war began before our birth. It will continue after our death. And if opposition to God, this battle in which we, uh, we engage, if that opposition to God were not bad enough, the next chapter, Revelation 13, goes on to describe an impersonation of God. If Satan and his angels could not defeat God, they set themselves up as a false God themselves. This, um, I, I know when I gave you the, when I gave Becky the notes, I called this the, the unholy trinity. And the more I thought about it, I don't even like to call it a trinity because it's not a God. So I've, I've renamed it a triad. And, and I moved unholy to lowercase. Because although Satan wants to present himself as a mighty uh, alternative to God, in reality, he's just a lowercase, unholy triad of three beings. The dragon that we saw in chapter 12 is the first part of the triad. He pretends to be God. And then in the first eight verses... <coughs> In the first eight verses of chapter 13, we are introduced to the first beast, the Antichrist, who comes from the sea. This Antichrist is the Messiah of Satan. We read in verses 5 and 6 that he speaks blasphemous things against God. I believe that this Antichrist is a political leader. The authority that we see in chapter 13, verse 17, is what makes me think that this beast is some sort of a political ruler of some sort, rather than an economic or a media powerhouse. Now look with me at verse 3 of chapter 13. This beast experiences a wound which seemed to be fatal, but then he was healed. But then he was healed. Even in this 
Christ character, this Messiah of devil, this Antichrist, his wound was not an actual death like Jesus was. Jesus was actually really dead and then resurrected. This one experiences a wound that seems to be fatal, but then he is healed. This is just a weak impersonation of the true Christ of God. But verses 7 through 10 go on to tell us that this anti Christ goes to make war against the earthly saints. And when this Antichrist is not able to accomplish his purpose, then a second beast arises from the earth that we read about in verses 11 through 14. This is a false prophet, and just as we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I believe we have dragon, Antichrist, and false prophet pictured for us here as the unholy triad. This false prophet from the earth, I believe, is a religious leader because look at chapter 13, verse 12. He forces worship. That's what religious people do. And so if the second person of the triad was political, this third person is a religious force of some sort. Now I notice that we see a um, red dragon's head, horns, and diadems, which connects with the political powers of chapter 12, verse 3. The Antichrist is associated with heads, horns, and diadems, chapter 13, verse 1. And now the false prophet, the second beast, is directing worship towards the first beast, and we'll see in a minute its image. Now verses 13 to 14 tell us that this false prophet performs false signs regarding the Antichrist. When I look at this story in verses 13 and 14, I, I, I'm starting to see a, a uh, political spin job that is working. Because back in verse 3, it's honestly told what seemed to be a fatal wound. But now we get to verse 12 and verse 14, and as the story is being told, it was a fatal wound. Now, how many of us have seen politics where somebody says something, and then the next time it gets reported, the, the fish gets a little bit bigger? And then the next time the story is told, the fish gets a little bit bigger? And just as a fisherman tends to exaggerate his tale, I think what we have here is this wound that seemed to be fatal is taking on a life of its own. And the more it's retold, the more it's told to be a genuine, authentic wound. But I think it's important for us to realize that just as the Spirit of God points to the Son of God who fulfills the purpose of God the Father, we have this second beast who points to the first beast who does the work of the devil himself. But just as when Jesus was on this earth in a physical body, a physical body can only be one place at one time, while God can be omnipresent, Jesus could not be omnipresent when he was in the flesh. The same thing we see here in this unholy triad. The second member of the triad cannot be everywhere, and so what they do is they establish some image some replication of this beast. <coughs> the statue, this image, whatever it may be, is given human-like qualities. Now, as technology moves forward, and we experience new forms of artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, and now something called a metaverse, it's hard to imagine, it's not hard to imagine some inanimate object being given breath and voice. 
And so we see the technology around us that would have, in John's day, seemed to be, wow, there's a statue that somehow is given a voice. But today, with our virtual reality and computer graphics, we can see an inanimate object that is given breath and voice. And so we see exactly what is prophesied here 2,000 years ago as something that is going to happen in the end times. This beast um, pretends to be living while it is inanimate and, lo and localized. But notice that this localized beast slays those who refuse to worship. Those who refuse to worship. Where else have we seen this? Remember Daniel? Nebuchadnezzar? Everyone needs to bow down to the statue. And if you see anybody who doesn't bow down, you just go ahead and kill them. And that's exactly what happens in the end times. This beast is established and the false prophet points to the image of the beast and says, all right, y'all, bow down and worship this imitation, this anti-Christ. And if you refuse to worship that, we're going to take your life. And just to make sure that you were, if you were absent that day, that we worshiped the beast, what we're going to do is we're going to issue some sort of a mark so that everyone can tell if you are for or against us. Either you're for God or against God. Either you are for the beast or you are against the beast. And we see in verses 16 through 18 that there is some sort of a mark that indicates those who are for the beast. The placement of this mark is upon the hand or the forehead. The purpose of this mark is is to control the economy. If you don't have the mark, you're not allow, allowed to conduct trade. Now, and I'm not as concerned about what the mark actually is. It may be a tattoo. It may be a subdermal um, microchip. I don't know what it is. But it is something that will identify that, he, that you're playing nice with the world system. Have we not seen how masks or vaccine cards or proof of a negative COVID test were used in this manner during the pandemic? Businesses, schools, airlines, employers were prohibiting access unless a person complied with their expectations. Even this week in Montreal, Canada, 10 healthy Kansas City Royal players were not permitted to play their game because they didn't have vaccine cards. And so we see if you don't have the card, you can't earn an income. If you don't have the mark, you can't do business. And it's not about the mark, it's about the complicity with the world system. Now notice this mark, whatever it may be, is identified as three sixes. And I believe that six is less than seven. As a matter of fact, when someone has said, George Beasley writes in one commentary, many ancient languages did not have figures for numbers, but they used letters of the alphabet. A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, and so on. And this made it possible for a name to be represented by a number that was obtained by adding up the value of the letters. For example, not related to religion, not related to faith, there is a piece of graffiti on a wall in ancient Pompeii which reads, I love her whose name is 545. Doesn't that just warm your heart? Now, if you are the woman who is 545, you might derive a little bit of pleasure out of this. 
To me, it's like watching the trains with all the graffiti. I can't make out what they're trying to say. But to the person that it refers to, it's a sign of endearment. And doubtless, this young lady whose name that was, so also despite the many possibilities that the number 666 yields, it's virtually certain that the individual thereby indicated was known in all the churches that were addressed by John. And probably far wider. For example, if I asked you, who is number 15? Mahomes. See, you automatically connect it with the Kansas City Chiefs, number 15, Patrick Mahomes. And so, to many people, if 10 years ago I said, who's 15? You, uh, But at that time, the number reveals exactly who it is. And so at this time, the number 666, while it may be obscure to us, they knew exactly who it was talking about. As a matter of fact, um, the name Nero Caesar, when it's transliterated from Hebrew into Greek, yields the number 666. And so during John's day, they would have thought of Nero Caesar is this political antichrist being described. Now Beasley goes on to write that for Christians, 666 was an eminently suitable figure for the Antichrist because it represents a consistent falling short of the divine perfection suggested by 777. Whereas in the name Jesus in Greek, if you total it up, it's the number 888. So if the Antichrist falls short of God, Jesus himself fully embodies the person of God. Now, I don't want to get distracted in this numbers and who it may be referred to, because attempts to oppose or to imitate God always come up short. And these attempts always come up sixes rather than sevens. And eventually, if we try to oppose God, if we try to imitate God, it yields final separation by God, which we see in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. The first five verses talk about those who reign with God. And this is meant to encourage when we see the world full of evil and we wonder if the struggle is worth it, we need to be reminded that God wins in the end. And when we see the evil and we are tempted to act like the world, we need to be reminded that those who choose God's side will reign with God over the wickedness that is to come. And so these first five verses... <coughs> are describing our reigning with God, and it ought to give strength in our spine. Because the ones who were sealed by God earlier are now, uh, are now pictured worshiping with Christ, and later they will come ruling with Christ. This progression encourages us that we have aligned to the right side, even if current circumstances don't look like it. And so these five verses talk about a future reigning, and that ought to give you courage to stay tough. Because when we reign with him, we will judge in all righteousness. Chapter 14, verse 7 says, To those who oppose God, the second angel says, Judgment has come. And verse 8 says, the reason that judgment has come is because immorality is flowing in the world. And so we did, a we did a choice to make right now. Will we align with God or will we align with evil? And if we align with evil, eventually that looks like immorality flowing throughout society. 
I find it interesting that unbridled passions and sexual immorality are the signs of a duly deserved wrath and torment that is about to be poured out. The very cause for pride last month becomes the reason for judgment in the last days. And after they are judged and they come up lacking before a righteous and a holy God, he says, all right, now it's time to reap. It's time for a harvest. The time has arrived in Revelation 14 to execute the judgment on the wicked and those who have stood against God. Now we see both a reaping of the wheat and a gathering of the grape harvest, which we would think of if we read the story as two events. But if you look into Joel chapter 3, verse 13, it was prophesied that these two harvests are one event. It's one oracle of God's judgment upon sin. But then I notice, whatever this reaping of wickedness looks like, it is represented by extreme bloodshed. The thing I want to take away from our service this morning is that your allegiance matters. I do not equate honor or submission or obedience with worship. It's possible to be allegiant to one's country without worshiping its leaders. But our allegiance that which we choose to align matters. I know many people who have purchased a jersey with a certain player's number or name just to become ashamed later when that player did something that was unwholesome. So the only numbered jersey you'll find in my closet is for a player who is now dead. Because once he's dead, I don't have to worry about him doing anything that would be um, bring reproach upon his name. Brands I have purchased in the past, I no longer give them a cent of my money because of causes that they have adopted or personalities that they have promoted. Because allegiances matter. If we truly do not wrestle against flesh and blood, and if there are arguments intentionally set up against God, we must be extra vigilant about our allegiances and about our support. Because in the end, those who set themselves up against God will endure torment. Remember Joshua saying to, to the people, Choose you this day whom you will serve. And he goes on to say that verse that appears in many of your um, posters or artwork in your living room. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So my challenge for us is as we look at this end time battle of the holy war that we are engaging right now, our allegiance matters, and so I invite you to stand on the Lord's Son. I ask you the question from hymn number 484, who is on the Lord's side? Stand with me as we sing together.
on the news. You may not find peace in your neighborhood, but we can experience grace and peace from God our Father if we align on the Lord's side. God bless you. Go in peace. Amen.